Mona Forrest and on behalf of the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Challenges and Innovation in Canadian Access to Treatments and Innovations. Today we're excited to bring you live an important workshop at the Expert Patient Advocates and 21st Century Therapies Forum taking place now in Toronto. It will be moderated by Bill Dempster of 360 Public Affairs. For those of you who haven't attended an earlier webinar, this webinar is hosted by the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. At CCSN, we work with patients, survivors, families, partner groups, and sponsors on collaborative action to identify and remove barriers to optimal patient care, to ensure access to education and action opportunities and survivor involvement in healthcare decision making, and to support evidence-based research on ways to promote equal access to early diagnosis, timely treatment, and follow-up care. If you'd like to learn more about CCSN, you can visit us on our website, www.survivornet.ca. You can also join us next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a webinar on the Cancer Medication Geographical Roulette in Canada, where we'll explore disparities in the ways that cancer treatments are managed and funded across Canada. You can sign up for that webinar by visiting the front page of our website. That was, again, www.survivornet.ca. Finally, we'd like to thank our 2015 webinar series funders, Novartis, Merck, and especially Bollringer Engelheim for making today's webinar possible. We'd also like to thank the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders for sharing this informative panel of speakers with us today. Now, we'll shortly send it over to Bill, live from Toronto. Okay. Welcome. We're just waiting to Bill Dempster to join us from Toronto in, in another uh, minute and a half. Uh, this is a webinar produced by the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network and the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders. And they're meeting today in Toronto at the Expert Patient Advocates and 21st Century Therapies Forum in Toronto. And this will be live from Toronto now moderated by Bill Dempster of 360 Public Affairs. Um, we have over 60 and still going up, I see, number of people from across Canada on our webinar today. I'm still looking to see uh, who we've had from furthest away, but we'll keep tuned for news of that. Um, yeah, numbers are going up, so thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. We can see on our cameras, at least, that the Toronto group is just getting settled at their uh, panel um, discussion table and uh, this is uh, an exciting new thing for us to do remote but uh, I think this may not be this is the first one it may not be the last one so thank you for joining us uh, if you want to know more and you don't know us very well we're the Canadian Survivor Network um, our, you can visit us on our website at www.survivornet.ca and learn more about the exciting series of webinars that we're in right now, which will continue uh, into early December. Uh, these are free webinars and uh, help our mission of uh, helping patients help themselves. We support research. We're working on having patient voice heard strongly in healthcare decision making in Canada. There's a lot of opportunities for learning free through our webinars and if you look on our front page of our website, there's a participate section where what you've learned about advocating for yourself and others in cancer care can be put to use on opportunities um, to participate in various decision making bodies and we list these all, all on our front page. Okay, I'm going to send us over to Bill in Toronto now. Welcome Bill. Just hold on, we're almost there. Uh, Bill Dempster is going to be joining us in it.
You want me to go podium? No, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to pass the picture now. Okay. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to take their seats, please. I hope uh, you all had a, a good lunch. And you're all as excited as I am, and we are, about taking part in a session uh, that's going to go well beyond this small part of Toronto and actually be webcasted and, and, and live broadcasted across the country. Uh, my name my name is Bill Dempster. I'm with 360 Public Affairs, and uh, I have the honor of, of working a fair amount with the board, uh, as many of you know. So it's great to see so many friendly faces uh, in, in the audience. And uh, another thing that I, I'm uh, happy to do is support the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network in their webinar series. Um, I had a bit of a conflict today uh, in that I was supposed to be in Ottawa doing a webinar today at 1 p.m. Uh, but we resolved that really well, I think, by, uh, by saying, well, why don't we do both together? And so uh, with the inspiration of, of uh, Durhan Wang Rieger and Jackie Manthorn uh, of the Cancer Survivor Network, uh, they were very amenable to live broadcasting this webinar from Toronto uh, to people as far away as the Yukon. We've had people log in from overseas before. Uh, to learn about uh, access to therapies in the 21st century. Um, so uh, Patient Experts in Health Technology Assessment was actually launched by Durhan a few years ago, and the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network runs uh, a series of advocacy web webinars, and the real idea is to educate uh, the patient community uh, across the country on, uh, on access to treatments, and not just access to treatments, but to support groups, uh, et cetera. Um, and today, both groups are delighted to combine forces on a live event and webinar. Uh, and this is featuring Canada's experts on treatment access and innovation. Uh, Canadians rely more than ever on prescription drugs uh, as a key part of their health care, and they have, in essence, become an essential medical service. However, uh, Canadians' access to new treatments is unique in the world in terms of how we fund and deliver these products through uh, a very different combination of private uh, drug programs which cover around 24 million of us uh, to some extent, and then uh, the public drug pro programs that cover the balance of us. Uh, of course, most provinces have a final backstop stop in terms of catastrophic uh, drug insurance if anyone has to pay out of pocket over a certain percentage uh, of, of their income. After Health Canada authorization, new patented drugs are subject to a price ceiling review by the federal uh, pricing regulator, and, and we learned that acronym, I can see some, a mustache at the back of the room uh, from the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board. They undergo significant health technology assessment evaluation for comparative cost and clinical value. Not in that order, I should say. They, they go through the clinical, the comparative clinical value and then a cost uh, comparison. Uh, and we were very fortunate to hear from uh, Chandra Segal from, uh, from Cadith earlier as well. Um, HTA reviews can take place among all public drug, pro uh, drug programs and many private plans as well. And of course, patient access, especially to new specialty medicines, are always <laughs> subject to some level of limited use or special authorization. And, th and those often require healthcare professionals to complete forms. And that is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, what they have to do to make sure that the right product is used by the right person uh, at the right time. Now, this is a challenge and an opportunity for patients. On one hand, the increase, uh, increasing number of new specialty medicines that are coming to, coming to market every year could lead to less access to needed medicines, and, and that would happen if the drug programs put major restrictions on whether and how they're funded, and if they don't collaborate to make, make access appropriate and easier. On the other hand, today's meeting and this conference are actually testaments to a major opportunity for patients to be more engaged, empowered, and involved in the process. So this is, uh, many of you know who know me know that I'm an optimist, and this is a glass half full perspective, and you'll agree with me that we can find opportunities for patients and healthcare professionals, researchers, manufacturers, and governments, um, and other payer, uh, payers um, to find innovative solutions. And I'll just give one example that some of you uh, are already aware of or may already be aware of. The Ontario Rheumatology Association worked with uh, the private payer community over the recent months, and maybe that took years, in an effort to streamline and standardize the forms that healthcare professionals have to fill out in order to 
uh, obtain access for their patients uh, to uh, drugs for rheumatoid arthritis. And I would say today is an example of that opportunity. We've got uh, just over an hour and a half with, with public and private health plan experts, and we're not just going to stay in Canada today. The second half of our discussion uh, is actually going to go global, and we're going to learn how managed access programs and pathways are working in other countries and how uh, we can implement some of those innovations here in Canada. So actually, my, my, my coffee cup is half full, and so I'll, I'll now introduce the panelists. Uh, George Wyatt, to my immediate right, is an expert in health technology assessment and Canadian market access, and his common drug review tracker and P-coder tracker are very important tools to help uh, um, almost anyone uh, understand what's covered where and how, and George has very generously made some of those portals and access to that data uh, free for, for patients to be able to find out what's covered in, in which province under, under which plan. George will be followed by Stephen Frank, Vice President of Policy Development and Health with the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association. Uh, Stephen, we've been on several panels together, and I always find you to be an astute, thoughtful, and engaging voice uh, on these issues. Uh, we'll then hear from a, a friend and fellow traveler, uh, Suzanne Legault, who Hello. is built. Legault. Oh, Lepage, I'm so sorry. <laughs> who is Suzanne Legault? My cousin. Your cousin? Yeah, that's, 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 that's my mother's maiden name. Yeah. Why isn't she here? <laughs> she doesn't know much about drugs. Thank you. Um, she's built a very success, successful consultancy that bridges the perspectives of private health insurance programs and pharmaceutical manufacturers. I'll just say one anecdote. Uh, Suzanne's uncle, uh, James Barry, is, it was my old English prof and taught me how to write in grade 13. So that's the real relationship. <laughs> Um, after Suzanne, Lisa Callahan, uh, AVP for group, pro group products with, Man with Manulife will provide her perspectives and perhaps shed some light on what is happening uh, with the health benefit programs within Manulife, which, uh, which people have actually seen recently uh, in newspapers and some of the people in this group have been watching very, very closely. We're going to have a short Q's and A session then, and that will be followed by a second panel which will be kicked off. Uh, by, by my friend, and, and he doesn't know I, I was going to say this, but, but erstwhile mentor uh, in terms of uh, your level of knowledge. He knows Neil Palmer from uh, PDCI in Ottawa knows both Canada and the global pricing and, and patient access system like few others in this country. Um, we'll be looking for both solutions uh, from audience members throughout this and webinar guests. And an important player in this context, uh, many of you will know her or her organization from uh, Inomar Strategies. Uh, Sandra Anderson is going to walk through uh, the role of patient support programs as an innovative solution. And our final panelist will be Glenn Monteith, Vice President of Innovation and Health Sustainability at Canada's research-based pharmaceutical companies, RxD, who has recently held senior leadership uh, roles throughout the Alberta government, including responsibility for program change management, of which Alberta has gone through a lot in recent years and for several years uh, as head of the public drug programs in Alberta. And there are a few people in Canada to better comment on what might work and how to make it work in the real world given the real challenges faced by patients, payers, and manufacturers, among other stakeholders. Uh, and I understand you're going to focus uh, a lot on uh, responding to the panel that we're seeing here in terms of, of, of private uh, drug coverage in, in Canada. We're thrilled to have Glenn here with us today. So we're going to end the session with a final uh, Q's and A session and, and wrap up. And so with that, I'm going to pass the slide advancer uh, over to George to kick us off uh, with the first level uh, of questions. Any questions that you have, please come up to the microphone. Uh, and people who are on the line uh, on the webinar, Matt Handy is going to be reading them uh, to me over uh, my telephone very shortly as soon as they come up. But if you have an issue, I'm going to get up and make sure it advances for you there, George. Okay. That's wonderful. Thanks very much, Bill. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. After everyone here in the room and online as well. Um, we run a number of webinars at our firm, so we're very familiar with the technology. And uh, just waiting for Bill to advance the slide. So my my discussion today is going to focus on the public drug plan uh, process in Canada, how it works. And I've taken a very basic approach to this, so uh, people feel uh, if you're new, you'll get a good sense of what the process is about. And um, if you're an expert or uh, if you're more than familiar with this process, um, you can certainly be able to ask me questions afterwards on more specific things. 
So uh, off to the first slide. What, I, what you're seeing now is really the, the flow of how things go. And um, you know, typically a manufacturer will put a submission together uh, that uh, goes to um, Health Canada uh, to get the regulatory approval because with well, health regulatory approval you get nothing. All right, so your drug's not even available for sale in Canada. Now there are some drugs that are available under special access programs from Health Canada, but what we see eventually is that those drugs make their way to the Canadian system through the reimbursement process. And uh, that's always an interesting journey when you, when you do that transition. Uh, so there's, there's one element to think about. Then after that, the, uh, the product goes through the common drug review or through ENES, or in the case of cancer drugs, it goes through uh, PCOTER or again in ENES in Quebec. And these bodies do a health technology assessment. So if you look at common drug review, what they're looking at is they're trying to figure out if it's, if it's worth paying for a drug from a system perspective, which means are you going to spend less dollars on hospitalization, for example, or medical services than you are going to spend on the drug and the hospital services that go with it. So in other words, is this going to provide a benefit to the system? Um, because as you know, we don't have as many people in hospital these days as we used to, like 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so hospitalization is actually a last gasp approach for a lot of situations now, unless in very specific situations. So we've, we've seen great advances in pharmacotherapy um, starting in the 1960s. I think we've lived through in the last 50 years a true golden age of, of research and development and, and product improvement um, when you think of all of the products that come forward. And it's not just today, but there's still lots of changes happening. So these organizations, and I think you heard from Chandra this morning, they, they look at the drug from a health system perspective, a common drug review. Um, Ines does a little bit the same, but they also have a different perspective. So they take a more societal perspective in Quebec. So they're more interested in saying, you know, does your brother, sister, or spouse have to take you to the hospital or take you for this therapy? What does it mean to them, and so forth? So there's a lot less, uh, there's a lot more elements brought in, and so the submissions they're not exactly the same that go to these particular organizations. There, there are fundamental differences in them, and. Um, with common drug review, when you send a submission, it's a first come, first serve basis. With ENS, it's uh, three deadlines per year, and so you have to time your submissions for those deadlines. And um, now in ENS case, you can actually, if you get a priority review, you don't have to worry about a deadline, but that doesn't happen that frequently. So the next thing we talk about then is the PCPA. And I could spend the rest of the day talking about PCPA because it seems to take that long for them to do anything at PCPA because it takes forever to do anything at PCPA in summer cases. And I think it's a real, I think we're, I'm glad to see that they've got an office in place. Um, it's something I talked to Helen Stevenson about 2007 about doing that. Uh, and here we are in 2015 because it's really slowing things down. You're going to see that in a minute what the impact of that is. Uh, but that's driven by one real factor, which is the last thing where the province has provide the funding or the public plans provide the funding, and they're budget strapped like crazy. They're budget strapped like crazy. BC cut $100 million out of their drug plan budget last year. So if you want to add more, you got to take something out. And how do you do that? That's really, really challenging. So let's we'll see if this works. Okay, next slide. And, and around that discussion, you saw the PMPRB thing, that, that provides a price ceiling. Uh, for for uh, for drugs, and and I know they talked about that here this morning. So what you're seeing on the screen now, and I'm just going to move a little bit so I can see the screen as well, um, is you're going to see this is a common drug review versus the uh, group in Quebec. Is that microphone working? It is, but we won't be able to see you. Okay. Um, so the um, the we, we did an analysis uh, last year, looked at the uh, recommendations for common drug review and looked at the recommendations for Quebec. And you can see that Quebec is a little more lenient or a little more generous. We can talk about some specific examples, but this is, I see, what you might see here is the societal impact does play a role in terms of how they evaluate drugs. And that may tip the balance in some cases where you know, a, a product is sort of on the edge of a conditional versus a list, 
or a do not list versus a conditional listing, that societal uh, aspect plays, plays a role. Um, decoder, pretty much the same. Now, the situation in Quebec is a little bit different because of the way the regionalization of the cancer system is. I still think they're coming to terms with that. Having said that, um, there are still some issues in Quebec in terms of how Ines approaches it, and they're a recommendation body. So they tend to be, again, a little more open to different aspects of, of uh, the submission. And again, taking the societal perspective will make it easier for them. When I talk about health system perspective and societal perspective, do you know what I'm speaking about? Does anybody have a doubt about that, a question about that while I'm... Because that's an important element. Okay, we'll move on. The recommendation codes at Common Drug Review. Now, at times I've been critical of Common Drug Review and at times I've been very supportive of Common Drug Review. I will say this, this is an organization that continues to evolve and continues to change and they're not afraid to do so. And so uh, I, I applaud that because I think they try, they have a tough job on their hands and they're trying to, uh, trying to evolve in a way that's reflective of, of how the world is evolving for them. So uh, what happened in the early days is that we had, you know, four codes, list, list in a similar manner, list with criteria, and do not list. And in uh, 2012, that all changed over to list, list with criteria and conditions and or conditions, uh, do not list at submitted price, or do not list. And so this is where the, you know, in the previous one, we had to read through the recommendations very clearly to see if really it was um, a real economic issue or it was a clinical issue. But in the, with the new codes, it became a lot clearer. And so what this really meant was that if it was list, everything was good. If it was list with clinical criteria, that was the, the, the clinical criteria in place. When it was listed with conditions, it usually meant, you know, go to PCPA or go to the provinces and negotiate. And uh, if it do not list, it was do not list was very, very challenging for them to get a product listed uh, because it didn't, that meant basically the clinical didn't work. Now that's going to change. It's going to going to change and it's going to be more or less like what you have with PCoder now. So what, when PCoder moved into the Cadith, under the Cadith umbrella, what they've been trying to do over the last couple of years is try to get things harmonized to some degree. I think this is a good move. Um, again, we're, we'll want to see how the recommendations actually come out, uh, especially on the conditional side. Um, but that's, uh, that's really what it's, it's, uh, it's uh, intended to do. So uh, why is all this stuff important? Because these organizations take patient input. And I know you're having a big session on patient input tomorrow, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, we we know that you know you're going to be talking about this as the websites where you can go to to make your patient input, and and uh, you usually have to do that as part of a group. But there's pilot program on at Cadeth now taking individual patient input, so that'll see how that plays out. Again, Cadeth open to change, which is great. Um, Pcoder same thing, and uh, I'm not going to belabor the point because I know you'll spend a lot of time on it. But what you'll see is you know these are the places you need to go. Uh, the website location so it's easy to find because sometimes I have to say the new Cadeth website is sometimes a little more difficult to navigate than the previous one so I put the web links here for you so you'll have the slides and you can be able to, to go directly to that particular uh, page. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier with the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliances and you can see the number of products that have gone through and the uh, number that have been completed and so forth uh, so the vast majority of them are completed and, and you talk to people from Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, they tell you, well, they're actually doing quite a bit of work, um, but that's, you know, quite a bit of work is sometimes taking too long because um, uh, you can, you can uh, that slide is, sorry, that slide's out of order. So this is a Cadeth website for your newsletter. So to the, uh, the reimbursement, you can see, did I miss my slide on PCPA timing? Hmm. Something's wrong. Anyway, uh, so what you can see here is the time to public plan reimbursement. And a lot of this stuff now is being driven by the PCPA. So we break this down into the most minute details, but really what it comes down to from the time of NOC, you can see it's taking a long time to get products covered in this country. We have to do a better job. And I think we, you know, putting in more organizations sometimes is the right answer, but sometimes it adds a lot of time, which is, uh, which is too much. 
Decoder is the same thing. You have, you'll have the slides later. So the point is, it just it is taking time. And I think that's the there's the time, and I'm out of time. So you can tell that. Uh, so these are these are the stats. So things take a, things take a while to get through uh, at at these organizations. And uh, so I'll leave you with these couple of last slides. At the end of the day, sometimes Quebec acts quicker. Um, but now we're going to see that maybe change because they're going to join. They're joining PCPA. So what does that mean? They're doing negotiations. So what does that mean? Um, the patient import is important. It really is. We have seen it make a huge difference at times. And um, finally, you know, the PCPA process we've talked about being a delay. It's taking two to three years now to get a drug covered. That's a long time. We need to do better. Thanks very much, George. We're going to pass it over to Stephen. Just one quick note. You are a master of uh, Excel and producing some of these stats, so I would really encourage you to, to take a look at them, especially people from across the country in different provinces. They're, they're very useful. And we just did some analysis on time uh, that PCPA negotiations are taking, so I'll see if I can somehow put that out as well. So I'm sure you have some stats. Yeah, it goes from like days to years. Yeah, but the average we found was three and a half months for, for negotiation. Over to you, Stephen. Well, I can't claim to be an Excel expert, so I will have to chat afterwards. I'm not sure dubious, I'm an Excel expert. I was going to say dubious, a dubious <laughs> people are. Great. So I, I think one of the reasons that uh, you know we, we've been invited to speak today is because there is certainly a macro trend within the private insurance industry to start to look a lot more like the public plans. And I know that's a concern, and I want to explain to people what some of the environment is that we're dealing with in the private insurance industry and why we're starting to do the things that we're doing. And you'll hear a lot more, I think, at a micro level from Lisa when she speaks. Um, so a couple of things, I think, when we look back over the last, say, five to ten years, we had a very nice benign period of cost growth from about 2012 to 2014 or so. Um, and and that was really attributed, I think, in large part to a lot of the big blockbuster drugs coming off patent, coupled with very aggressive generic pricing reform. So prices came off very nicely, but we're starting to see those inch back up again. 2015 is looking like we're back to sort of historical norms. And so when plan sponsors and empl employers are looking at this, they're saying to themselves, okay, we come out of this nice benign space. As we look forward, we're getting increasingly concerned about what's coming. How are we going to manage that? And there's really three, I think, three broad areas that's driving that cost inflation. One is just the general demographic uh, aging reality in Canada. As people get relatively older, relatively use uh, greater use of medical, including drugs. And so that's, there's not a lot you can do about that, frankly. That's an issue that everyone's going to have to deal with in the country. But there's two new areas that have really, I think, uh, sharpened our mind. And one is that what I've called here specialty drugs. You could call them orphan drugs. You could call them biologics. There's all kinds of different criteria for this. But when you look at the growth in that segment, it's really quite unprecedented. You're seeing 12 and 15 percent cost increases within that piece. One percent of plan members now account for about a quarter of the spend. That was 15 percent of the spend even three years ago. We expect that to be up at 30, 35 within the next three or so years. So when you look at that and you forecast it, what's happening, people are very, very concerned about how do we continue to sustain access to those types of drugs. And something that's relatively new is sort of a mass market drug with a very high price, and I call that a budget buster. And so we've lived through that with some of the hepatitis C treatments. We see some stuff coming down the pipe that's on the anti-cholesterol piece. And, it, you know, not to oversimplify, but when you run the math on it, you just can't make the math work as to how we would provide access to everybody who potentially could be on those therapies. And so when you sort of step back from a, from a carrier perspective and the provinces are doing exactly the same thing, and you look at the numbers going out, you're saying to yourself, we can't continue on the same trajectory. What can we do to try and bring this under control? And that's with driving a lot of the activity. We do have, I was asked to comment really quickly on the drug pooling arrangement that we implemented in 2012 within the private insurers. Um, we had, uh, at the time, just to share a little perspective, when we were trying to design that pool and we were sitting around the board table, we thought that the highest cost drug we could conceive of ever reimbursing would be about $300,000 a year. And, you know, we wish we were in that, that criteria now. And we're only, we're only four years into it. You know, we're paying several well over a million dollars, paying 
eight or ten and a half million dollar and up range, the fastest growing areas in the 150 to 300 thousand dollar range. So it's well in excess of anything we even uh, on the outer bound had forecast, and our pool is growing at about 44 percent a year. Okay. It's not going to be sustainable, and so we're going to have to do something about it. What I've sort of circled at the bottom, and I think this is really important, is it is that at the end of the day, it's the employers in Canada who are paying for these prices. It's not the insurance industry. And so I do hear periodically, well, we'll pick on Manulife. Manulife makes billions of dollars a year. What, what's it to them about this? And as, you know, the cost of drugs, the cost of plans is borne by employers. You think about a small employer in Kingston, Ontario, who makes screws. You know, they are in a position of saying, maybe I really can't afford to be in this game anymore. So they're pushing for solutions and we're having to react. So that's sort of a macro, I think, context. What you're seeing provincially is you're seeing all the provinces are doing quite a bit of work within their own drug plans to try and address this. And so you've got stuff quite, quite, a, quite a bit. Actually, I think the biggest story right now is in Quebec where you've got sort of almost like a generational change into their drug plan and the types of things that they're allowing us to do as payers. You're seeing new catastrophic plans in PEI, New Brunswick. BC is doing a lot of interesting things. Alberta had a very uh, interesting plan prior to the new government, but they still got, I think, the intent still to collapse down their 18 or 19 programs into one or two. Ontario is doing a fundamental review. So you've got in every province is a different story about what they're doing, but it's all being driven around similar kinds of, of concerns. And then, of course, collectively, they're working together. So I won't get into the PCPA. We've probably covered that about as much as we need to, but I think the key point from our perspective certainly is the last one there. Um, the activity of the PCPA has been geared to date around bringing down costs for the public payers, private insurers, employers, individuals paying out of pocket are not benefiting from that. And we do think that's an area we need to be thinking about and possibly addressing in the short term. Now then on the insurer side, so you've got provinces doing a whole bunch of innovation and then within the insurers I can tell you it's unprecedented the capabilities that we have now as an industry again even compared to three or five years ago these would have all been asked uh, not all of them, but a number of these would have been aspirational kind of things you think about managing formularies step therapies case management preferred provider networks all those initiatives have been really uh, new to the market all of the insurers have varying degrees of ability to do that but I would say it's getting to be pretty ubiquitous and again being driven around how can we uh, put a plan and a process in place that allows us to reasonably think we're going to be able to sustain what we've got? And I know each of these, from a patient perspective, can cause some anxiety. Okay. And so um, I guess you know we do need to be talking with you and, and uh, building in your views as much as we can. From an insurer, from a macro perspective, we've got three areas we continue to focus on. We do believe everyone should be participating in the PCPA so that all Canadians are getting the same price for the same drugs. Uh, we do think there's a, a potential to do some more around the generic drug pricing, so we continue to urge that. And we are very uh, supportive of a fundamental review of the PMPRB. The organization's been there for about 30 years. I'm sure you heard some of that this morning. Um, I think it, at a minimum we owe it to ourselves to have a, a rethink about what it does and how it does it. And we think there's ways that can be made more effective. And then we'll hear about um, a little bit about uh, Lisa might cover this a little bit, but you're starting to see individual insurers, in absence of a system-wide approach, you're starting to see them go it on their own, negotiating their own pricing arrangements, negotiating their own formularies, and we're at risk, in some ways, of having the system blow off into eight or ten different directions. Okay, and that's a response to some of these concerns and the, and the feeling we need to get on with it, we can't wait. So really quickly, just to wrap up, specialty drugs are going to continue to strain uh, the sustainability of the system. And it's really going to push us to continue to think about pretty major reform that even, honestly, three to five years ago we would have said would have been beyond reach. I don't think anything has been taken off the table from our perspective. Government health care reform is going to continue, and I think it's going to accelerate. Uh, insurers are going to continue to invest in our ability to manage these costs on our own. But I do believe, and I, I think our industry is pretty clear on this, really if we want to address this for the long term, we've got to find a collaboration and a way to do that together. Don't think there's a solution where we each run and do our own, uh, own types of approaches. We end up just throwing risk across the fence at each other and not really solving the problem. So without reform, I really don't think the system's sustainable. 
It's not an option for us to keep doing what we're doing. The trick's going to be to do it in an intelligent and thoughtful way. So I'll really look forward to our discussions. And um, Bill's being a great taskmaster, so I'll pass it over to Suzanne. Thanks very much, Stephen. Over to you, Suzanne. The page. Uh, <laughs> and here's the microphone. We're just going to make sure the webinar okay. folks can hear, uh, hear everyone as well. So when we talk about a rising drug cost, I thought it might be helpful to share uh, some, some highlights from the 2014 Drug Trend Report from Express Scripts Canada. Is this not on? It's on. Okay. So Express Scripts Canada is one of Canada's largest pharmacy benefit managers and they process the pay direct claims transactions for a lot of major carriers including uh, Manulife and Desjardins and every year they look at their, their uh, drug claims to see what's happened and what's changed to understand how private drug plans are growing and so I thought it might be helpful to summarize a few key points so you understand someone who is managing a private drug plan so whether that be your husband, your neighbor, your, uh, your, uh, you know, your co person you coach hockey with, how they're looking at their drug plan is what they're seeing is that the average drug spending for one claimant has gone up by 2.7 percent and on its own that doesn't necessarily seem like a lot but if you think if you're, about you're running a business, if your actual sales are going down or your operating costs or other operating costs are going up, that's significant and that's just the drug cost that doesn't look at all the other costs in a benefit plan. Now traditional medications which is anything that's not a specialty medication uh, that actually declined by 0.3 percent and one of the reasons for that as Stephen alluded to is because of generic drug reform and the number of drugs going off patent increased use of generic uh, mandatory generic plans and private plans but when you look at specialty medication those drug costs increased by 12.1 percent 9.2% uh, in the cost per prescription and utilization grew by two, almost 3%. It represents only 2% of the number of claimants, so the number of claims is quite low, but in terms of your overall spending, it's over 26%, and it's expected to reach up to 35% in the next four years. And, you know, when you look at the top claimants, the top 1% of all claimants equal 28% of spending or the equivalent to the other 85% of the claimants. And so when you're thinking about managing a plan, and again, most business people who have a benefit plan are relying on a benefit plan advisor. And they're looking to them and saying, how can I keep these costs in line with my other operating costs? And so they're looking for advice on how to manage. And if you're looking at numbers, if you're a numbers person, if you're just looking at the numbers of a benefit plan, and I'm going to talk to why they look at numbers in a few minutes, is they're seeing that these specialty drugs are what's driving my cost and what am I going to do about them. Uh, Stephen alluded to just earlier about hep C drugs and I'm going to show you some highlights from the hep C world. There are some great advances uh, medically in terms of hep C treatments in uh, 2014. However, they were a huge hit onto private drug plans and again I show highlights from Green Shield and Express Scripts and I use it just as an example because this is just one area and this is happening in multiple areas. So. Um, for Hep C drugs or Green Shield, the claims increased by 189% and their spend, the dollar spent, increased by 424%. And if you're looking at uh, in Express Scripts Canada, that was the therapy class that grew the most in 2014. And again, they saw utilization and uh, cost increasing. And so in the 10, 15 months alone, these costs increased by 10 times what they were the previous year. And if you, you may not realize, but drug um, claims or drug premiums that are set are set up to 15 months in advance of the actual uh, uh, plan year. And so think about it, when you look at this 15 month, is that did the actuaries and did uh, the, the organizations, could they actually predict the growth in this area? And it's not that there wasn't benefit in terms of the growth, uh, in terms of these, the uh, access to these medications and the health outcomes. It's just, is it a sustainable cost when you're looking at overall cost? And bear in mind that for benefits, you're sharing, those costs are being shared with salary, uh, they're being shared with pension, all those costs go under usually one compensation umbrella. And so when a plan sponsor says to their benefit plan advisor or to their insurer and say, geez, why did my costs go up so, up so much this year, my premiums, this is one example of one area that although the medical break breakthrough is significant, 
the cost is significant as well. And that and a plan sponsor has to look at how that's impacting them. In terms of private drug plan trends, um, Stephen alluded to some of these earlier. Um, we're seeing a growth uh, in what we call of case management of drug claims. And you know, when it comes to disability plans, there's been case managers for years where if someone went, went off on a disability claim, they'd be assigned a case manager to make sure they're getting appropriate treatment, to make sure that they're getting access to the, you know, if it's a physiotherapist or a psychotherapist or whoever they needed, to make sure that they were getting healthy and back to work. When you think about it, some of the prices of these drugs that Stephen alluded to, those costs are equivalent to a disability claim, so it only makes sense for the payer to invest in a case manager who has training in that area to work with the patient to ensure they're getting the appropriate treatment for their whole condition, and therefore we've seen the growth in some of the insurance carriers requiring the patient to work with a case manager and make sure that they're making a good investment on their plan. We're seeing an increased use of prior authorization as it relates to uh, a lot of the specialty medications to make sure that they're being used in the right situation for the right diagnosis and the right progression of the disease. Preferred provider pharmacy networks, if even a little bit of the acquisition cost can be reduced through uh, preferred provider arrangements, that can offer significant savings to the plan sponsors who are paying for these drugs. And they, again, they make sense in terms of you're trying to reduce your overall cost. And, Hopefully that some of those costs being reduced makes more room for, um, uh, for paying other drugs. Managed formularies are becoming more popular where in the past many plans covered all drugs that legally requiring a prescription. Some plans don't feel that that's, uh, they can pay for every drug now so they're looking to formulary managers, uh, either their insurer, their PBM or external groups. We also see in some therapeutic areas what we call maximal allowable cost pricing where they reference other drugs in the category to determine the price. Step therapy, making sure people progress in the right treatments. Government integration where uh, making sure that if there is government coverage for the patient uh, that they access that government coverage first. And product listing agreements where now private plans are saying, okay, we cannot afford to pay for the drugs as they've come to market and the prices they are, so they're engaging um, with the uh, pharmaceutical companies to negotiate a price, and I think maybe uh, potentially Lisa will be talking a little bit about that in her presentation. But as patient groups, I want to give you some food for thought and uh, just some things that I think about as I transition. I sort of have a foot in the both in the, all these worlds is that you know, if private plans are going to start to assess the value of a medication and comparing treatments, then how are they doing so? And what is valuable to a private payer could be completely different than what's valuable to a public payer. Whether someone's using less hospital resources is not a cost that a private payer saves on. But if they spend less time in the hospital, that's valuable to the private payer because they get someone back to work sooner. If someone doesn't have to see the doctor as much, the paying for the doctor, but they are potentially getting back to work sooner or more productive or less work time. So I think that the value argument has to be quite different for private payers. And also from that is determining what is the right price. So I think we need health technology assessment that has to be applicable to private payers. I think plan sponsors, those that sponsor the benefit plan, have to really think about what is the purpose of their benefit plan. Do they continue to want to cover every single drug that their plan member needs? Or maybe is the goal to provide them some comfort and to provide them some security that when they get a catastrophic illness, the protection will be there. So perhaps we need to move to a model that, for example, is a high deductible plan, that maybe the antibiotics and other things are paid out of pocket by the patient, so the protection's there when someone really needs the benefit. The thing that's really important to remember as a patient advocate is drug costs are a line item, a dollar amount to be managed by the plan sponsor. They don't know because of privacy and confidentiality who has what condition and what benefit they get from that condition, or from the treatment that they get. And that's really important to know that you are protected by that privacy, but it also blinds your plan sponsor from knowing the benefit that you get from your treatment and understanding the impact of those drug plan design changes on what that would mean to patients. And so what I think is really important is that as patient advocates, the best thing you can do is share patient stories from the perspective of a plan sponsor and how access to medication is improving 
uh, that plan sponsors investment. And we have to look at shifting the dialogue from drug plans as a cost to drug plans as an investment. And the only way we can do that is moving it from a line item to be managed to understanding what that investment is. And so those are some food for thought or some thoughts that I leave you with. And I'll turn the uh, microphone over to Lisa. Yes. Thanks very much, Suzanne. And just before you get started, Lisa, thank you for passing down the, I'm going to call that my minion mic. You just need a uh, <laughs> little eyeball in front of minions so you clear that it's a minion. Um, uh, I was asked by Matt uh, online to, to mention that we have people online from California, British Columbia, North Carolina, PEI, and as far away as Melbourne, Australia. So thank you all for participating in the oh. webinar. And we have dozens and dozens of people from uh, Ontario, Quebec, and Alberta. So really good. Uh, participation. I would encourage those of you in the room to start thinking about some of the questions that you have on this panel after Lisa's uh, uh, session. We're going we're to quickly do that. And also people online, please type your questions in. Matt will be emailing those to me and I'll, and I'll uh, do my best to get them all in. Lisa, over to you. Thanks so much. So I wanted to start by uh, thanking Johan who asked me um, to come and join in, uh, join this meeting and talk with you um, specifically about Maine Life and, and the Drug Watch program. There was an article in the Global Mail earlier this week and I know that's uh, raised some questions and so I'm really pleased to be able to be here um, and to chat with you about it. I think that my colleagues, I guess I should thank my colleagues too for shortening their presentations to allow me a few minutes to talk. I don't have slides. Um, I think they've established that the employer plays such a critical role uh, in the whole drug landscape. In 2014, employers paid for over $12 billion of drugs, which is over a third of all of the drug expenditures um, in Canada that year. We have the privilege of being the steward of 24,000 customers across Canada, and we have a common goal with them to ensure the sustainability of the employer-sponsored plans. If employers start to step away from the drug plans, um, that you know, leg of what I call a three-legged stool, if that's eroded, that is going to be a problem for all of us sitting in this room, for any Canadian and any patient. So having the contributions of the employer um, and making sure that it is sustainable is, is a common goal that we have with them. Um, you know, historically, employers have had open formularies. As soon as a plan has Health Canada approval, the drugs would be paid. And there's a great deal of benefit for patients in that model. The tides have really turned and I would say the conversations I'm having now with employers relative to eight or even uh, as recently as eight months ago are extraordinarily different and the catalyst for change in those conversations really was hepatitis C. The new uh, hepatitis C drugs that came onto the market, what it did is it drove a material spike in the prices and the increase in the cost to the plan sponsors. Um, employers do pay for the drug plans and so those costs get passed along to the employers and when there was a recognition of these spikes in the cost, questions start to come in when the employers start realizing that this is more of the new normal and more of this is to come. We started to see different behaviors and I wanted to share with you a couple of conversations that I've had with, um, with employers and their representatives. I have had comments in the last six months around, you know, I would drop my drug benefit plan if I could except my competitor still has one and I'm worried I'd lose my people. I have had questions as to whether or not it's okay to remove all biologics off of their formulary. I've had questions if it's okay to remove all new generation hepatitis C drugs off of the formulary. And I'd say the most concerning conversation that I've had um, was with a, with a couple of sponsors who, on the smaller side, with member consent, wanted to remove members from the drug plan in order to pass those costs onto the provinces to cover because they simply can't afford it. Um, you know, if you look at this financial pressure and budgetary pressure that the employers are, are put under, the easiest solution for them to manage their budget in, and to manage these sudden spikes is to put in a cap. And you know, we can cap plans to as little as $1,000 per year per member. And um, you know, once, once the plan sponsor makes the decision to cap their plan, there's very little incentive to go back and reverse that decision and open it up. In fact, um, I was notified of one of our largest employers who decided to implement a cap on their drug plan in order to help manage budgets going forward. Now, that said, it's a fairly generous cap, but for um, members who may be on Solaris or Vimizin, 
we're talking about having to now cover hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that the employer would have would have covered in the past. And so it's really within this environment that we brought our drug watch plan uh, to market. The intent is to leave this pressure and leave this spike of costs caused by net new drugs that are coming to market that are going to generate a net new financial impact. It is an alternative to capping because we fundamentally believe that when drug plans are capped, it is a very blunt instrument that's that flows across all of the plans, it impacts all members, and those individuals who need to access expensive drugs are impacted to the greatest extent. Um, Drug Watch also it provides an environment where we can we have the opportunity and the time to establish the appropriate access protocols and price controls to, to deliver value to employees and our, our our employers, sorry, and our employers are asking for this extra level of due diligence and and you know, they want and they deserve to get some sort of sense that it is worth covering these drugs and that there's value in it, um, especially in this very rapidly changing landscape. I fundamentally appreciate and Manulife appreciates this is a significant change for patients. Um, I do want to emphasize that Drug Watch is not focused on all new drugs coming to market. We are focused on drugs that coming to market will have a material net new financial impact. And I also don't want to leave you thinking that therefore all high cost drugs are being targeted. This is a, it's a combination of both cost and demand to, and, and what else, the alternative therapies that are available to understand if this is a net new financial impact. Um, for those drugs, they will not be covered immediately as they have been in the past. And I do appreciate that that is a change. Um, and as I said before, the alternative of not trying to put in some sort of solution to alleviate the pressure would be the easiest solution is capping. I do want to proactively address um, CADIS. CADIS is part of our evaluation process. And uh, I know that there have been some concerns raised about the length of time that that evaluation process takes. CADIS rep represents for us a very strong system um, that act, can access e uh, experts across Canada today. Um, it didn't make sense for us to try and replicate and to rebuild the type of primary economic evaluation that they can deliver. Um, uh, but that said, we do add to, um, to the analysis impacts that are specific to plan sponsors or employers, such as the impact on long-term disability. That's not included in, in how they're looking at things. Um, the, the addition with CADIF and the method that they have methods to actually hear and consider patient input is something that is valuable as well. I do want to clarify that Drug Watch is not adding time on top of what delays that, that are already being experienced. It is done, um, the, the CADIF review is the CADIF review that is publicly available. Because, through Drug Watch, we have also created the opportunity to have leverage to have the discussions and negotiations with pharmaceutical manufacturers. We represent about 20 to 25 percent on any given day um, of the private market, and uh, by not covering those drugs immediately, there, it certainly changes uh, the landscape and the conversations and the leverage that we have. And there's, um, there has been quite a bit of interest and positive response from pharmaceutical manufacturers in talking to us about how to get the drug cover because make no mistake of it, we want to make sure that we give access to valuable drugs as soon as we can for patients who need them. Um, we are not part of the PCPA. The length of time it takes to negotiate through PCPA is not reflective of the experience that we have had in terms of time in the negotiations <laughs> and negotiations um, will start and have started even before um, Health Canada approval in some cases. So we do recognize that the landscape is changing very rapidly. You know, our goal, as I said before, is to provide access to drugs um, that add value within a sustainable system. And as the industry evolves, um, the solutions will evolve too. This is probably the busiest time um, ever in, in the history of insurance around developing new solutions to, to tackle some very, very challenging um, challenging circumstances and we do not have all of the answers. Um, Drug Watch is the protection that we, we needed to put in place to alleviate um, the, the need to move to a capped plan because we felt once 
plan sponsors move down that path, there really is no coming back. Um, you know, Manual Life welcomes the opportunity to work with all stakeholders, whether that's you know, patients, employers, provinces, pharmaceutical manufacturers, and our industry competitors to build new systems and to build new solutions. We all have a responsibility and a part to play to ensure that we have a drug system in Canada that, that meets patients' needs and is sustainable. Um, and so, you know, as stewards of our customers, um, we want to have ongoing dialogue to, as a, as a means of finding those future solutions to be able to, to bring it to, to bring them to market. So thanks so much. Okay, now we have uh, about 10 minutes for Q&A, so then uh, we'll welcome up to the next panel. This is a great opportunity for people here, and for those of you who are online, uh, I didn't mention it, but I should say there are people in the room here from across the country as well. Um, hats off to Durban, the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, for, for helping bring patient experts and, and uh, educate them and, and interact with them so that they can uh, better interact with, uh, with with some of the the programs. In fact, that, that Lisa, you were mentioning, and some of the innovations. I think that, uh, that you're going to hear from uh, the panelists today. So please don't be shy, uh, and I'll repeat your questions so that we can hear it. When passing the minion mic, we'll put it in the middle. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to spray paint it yellow next time. Spray paint it yellow. I'll start saying banana, banana, banana. So uh, please. Hi, I'm Gary Klein. I'm from BC, and I'm from Secure um, I was wondering if there were any proposed legislation to put a cap on pricing. Who wants to try that one here? <laughs> but is that, isn't that PMP? Here, here you go, Stephen. Well, the, the answer is no. Um, there's nothing proposed, and and um, I think it's a, it's an interesting question because there is a there is a you know, conceptually, you say to yourself, there is an upper bound of what you would pay, like is $100 million for one individual too much? You know, is $10 million too much? Like at, at some point, start, you, you say to yourself, there's a, there is an absolute level. Um, but nobody, and so no one is doing serious work around that. But you know, you've got to, I think these are some important questions we're going to need to be grappling with. There is a point above which you really start to ask some fundamental questions. Sorry, George, can we go in choir here and, and respectfully disagree? Yeah. Um, because the we heard earlier from the man with the mustache at the back of the Medicine Pricing Review Board that in fact there is um, a, de facto, there, a de facto cap in Canada which uh, protects consumers against non-excessive prices. And uh, I don't think the government approves something that's $10 million. Now, I guess your point though is they use comparator countries and so if we get a product that costs that much in the basket of countries globally, then that might actually be the, the actual cap. Now that's hypothetical, uh, and if that's the case, then you know we hope that maybe one person would use that product, right? Because uh, but maybe you want to respond to that. So I would say we'd have had the same discussion at a million two three years ago. Okay, nobody conceived of a million two in perpetuity for one individual three or four years ago. We're there. We've blown through that. So where does it? I mean, the question is a good one. We we haven't. It's you know we're going to have to grapple with that. There is an upper bound somewhere. Where we're it's going faster and faster and faster and faster. And so I don't know where that uh, where that ends. But the PMPRB will not put an absolute level on anything. It'll cap it relative to what it sold globally. But that price could go up, you know, sort of indefinitely. So it's a good question. But the answer is no. There's nothing that we're aware of that, that would, from a regulatory or or any other perspective, be putting a limit on that. Suzanne? Hi, Suzanne White. A um, couple of comments and questions. George mentioned in your process, I was wondering where the special access process uh, program fits into that your charts, because um, especially when it makes a transition for NOC, like, you know, there's that disparity between the two, so that's the first part that concerns me. But secondly, um, with the special access program and book Park period in particular as an example, um, in Quebec, if you live there, then you can get access to the medication when you have an attack, which causes irreversible nerve damage if you don't get treatment time. But in the rest of Canada, 
depending, you know, you're subject to sort of a, a, a postal code lottery, and it's not covered to the point where physicians even said, look, if it was at the end of my prescription pad, I would give it to you. But it isn't, and I'm not going to go to the hospital or whatever and fight for it. So that disparity across the country. And the other thing, in terms of um, private insurance, if something is covered by a private insurer for a whole bunch of the population that doesn't have, you know, insurance that are self-employed, does is there something in place for the provinces to say, okay, this being covered by Manulife, and just because we're not working for a good company, we should cover the cost of that as well. Is there something in place for that so at least you get some sort of so you're alluding to the hot potato game. <laughs> we have to repeat the question really quickly. In fact, there was a three-barreled question. Update on special access program. Uh, why does Quebec cover something sometimes that other, other provinces don't, so patchwork quilt coverage? And uh, finally, I think it was on private insurance, when some people have access to private insurance. In certain, uh, you know, in certain cases, would would the public plans cover somebody who's self-employed that doesn't have access to that kind of big group plan? So back to you, George. So back to the hot potato, and and Stephen mentioned, you know, is there a way that they can take sometimes, uh, or I'm not sure if it's Stephen or Suzanne, but take a member off the plan uh, and see if that person would get government insurance. I was on a phone call with Ontario the other day, and they said, well, we want to be the insurer of last resort. And that's on a particular program that they have. That's They're the payer of first resort. So everybody's trying to be the payer of last resort right now. And so I, I was going to ask a question. How many of you are feeling really good now? Well, some are feeling good. <laughs> but but we, this is the fight of your life right now. And I know you're all committed, and it's all challenging, but it's really complex, and it's really challenging. It's challenging for the people that represent you know, government institutions. It's challenging for the people who represent private institutions. I'm an employer. I have a drug benefit plan at my company, and I'm happy to have it you know, because it, it's going to mean my, my people are at, at, uh, at work. But to get back to your question, the point is everybody's trying to pass the potato around right now. And so we don't. We sometimes have hard and fast rules, and sometimes we don't. With regards to Quebec, Quebec has passion d'exception um, that a physician can write a letter to the government and ask for special, special consideration for a particular patient. Those kind of programs do exist in other provinces as well, and sometimes they're really well kept secrets. Um, uh, but you know, I think governments do not try to deny people who genuinely just you know. Generally, generally. Yeah, I, I understand reality. So that gets me back to the first part of your question, which is around the SAP. So the special access program uh, is, you know, you have to, what happens is that a company has to apply to Health Canada to have their drug made available to people, and Health Canada makes that determination. And that drug then, the, the requests go to Health Canada, and the drug gets uh, delivered to that particular uh, uh, person through whatever mechanism of distribution. Once a company goes through the commercialization process and gets the notice of compliance, the special access program has to stop somewhere between 60 and 90 days following the notice of compliance. And then we have a gap. And we're dealing with this you know, with a couple of cases right now. We have a gap between the time of the SAP ending and the CDR or PCOTA review or ENES review coming out. And so what we've tried to do is make sure that current patients, at the very least, are not left in the lurch. And to, some, to, to a large degree, governments have been very good about that. And, and I, I don't think they're trying to be really you know, uh, friendly and, and, uh, and uh, you know, good to people. I think it's their responsibility to be that way. If they're already paying for a product, they should continue to pay for a product. The challenge is sometimes you don't have new patients covered under that product who actually quite deserve that product. And so we have that gap. And especially now with these added issues around PCPA, things taking longer, there's a big risk for some new patients now in that, in that gap period. And so that's a real challenge of how we have to deal with that. So these are policy-related issues. Did I answer your, all your questions? And, and George, George, you're going to be around, right? I'll be here today. Okay, yeah. good. So maybe it was a triple barrier question. Let's take it to to Gina, and then we're going to go online, and then and then go back to you, Gina. Hi, 
Thanks. I'd like to thank everybody. First, I'm, I'm Gina Brown, I'm a member of the board board and I'm a founding member of Dr. International. Um, hoping people would have a lot of process to listen. My question is for everybody. Um, we talked a lot about the different challenges and proposed solutions and you know where we're at and all of those. My question is for patient advocates such as us who have a lot of energies and even though we're one person, we try to get in there and do what we can, and patient advocacy organizations like CORE or CSPA. What else do you see coming down the pipe, either by virtue of different challenges that we haven't really talked about, like the changing government or individually tailored drugs or things like that? What hurdles do you see coming down the pipe that you think we also ought to be thinking about preparing ourselves for? So I'll just quickly repeat the question. What do you see coming down the pipe uh, in terms of hurdles that patients need to be aware of so they can engage better with the system? So over to you. Uh, and you have a microphone, I think it works. Is it, I'll take the microphone. Hey, hey, is it working, that one? <laughs> yes, this one works, although I feel like I need to, in the middle, I need to give you the big point. Um, you know, the one thing I think that uh, the private industry is grappling with, and I don't think that we have an, an answer on, is uh, genetic-based um, uh, drugs, right? And so when when it, uh, uh, when <laughs> I just speak after you for the first time, so now I get to go ahead. Thanks, Sue. Um, that's that's a hot topic, right? And as technologies and innovation progress to the point where we can each have, you know, designer drugs specific to our genetic code, what does that mean? What does that mean for privacy? What does that mean for insurers? What does that mean for patients? And I think that that's something that we've started thinking about and talking about, but certainly have not. We're not at the end decision, and, and we're still grappling with that and getting, you know, if this audience thinks about that and can provide some insight into what that might mean and look like that, I think that would be helpful. So when we get there, I don't know when we're going to get there, but when we get there, um, we'll have some good answers already. And just to dovetail on that comment is that the other thing is is that uh, you know, some of these require testing, and th there, th there's not such a nice straightforward mechanism to getting testing funded, especially when it's coordinated with a specific therapy. So whether that be in the private payer space, how the private payers pay for it, or whether the government pays for it, or does the government pay for a test when the drug is going to be paid for by the uh, private payer? So there's a lot of pieces about the testing, which is not, it's, it's considered important, and personalized medicine is important, but connecting all those dots in the Canadian system is challenging, and it's unique internationally. Thanks very much. We're going to have to actually call it, I think, for this panel, but would you like to just uh, pose your question or comment, uh, and I'll make sure that the webinar reads it. We might you don't have a chance to really dig into it. Please go ahead, sir. Well, it's, it's a very open-ended question. Right? We've talked about pressures on private insurers, pressures on government, and so forth. But what are the strategic pressures that we can apply to pharmaceutical companies? What would Uber them a little bit, disrupt them so that um, we get technological advances, but perhaps coming in at a more modest uh, price? So why don't we um, oh, park that, but we're actually going to hear that. Two seconds. Okay, two seconds. But I was going to say, no, we're not going to have to Because that, that is what DrugWatch does. It now gives us the leverage and the opportunity to do just that. And, you know, the hot potato comment of employer, employee, um, province, it disrupts that to say, how can we get the manufacturers to understand the responsibility they have bringing drugs to market that can actually support a sustainable model because right now it's cracking. Yes, thank you, Lisa, for that. And um, please join me in thanking the whole panel for, for their contribution this afternoon. I'd like to welcome up the next panel. We've got our next three guests. And in the meantime, just to your question, one of our guests is actually uh, uh, from the research-based uh, manufacturers. That's why I was going to say perhaps park it. It, it was a very broad question, but let's uh, let, let's tackle that in panel B. So do you have an order? between changing slides, that's always fun. So, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, pass it to the gentleman to my right, uh, Neil, to kick us off on panel B. Take us out of Canada, Neil. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Bill. 
Uh, I, I've got a few slides. I, I'm glad to hear there's someone on from Australia because I'm going to talk about Australia in just a minute. I'm going to talk about three countries, Australia, uh, Germany, uh, and England. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about the HST, but not the tax. So uh, more on that in a minute. Uh, the, the other point, that last question, I'm going to start there because that last question talked about what can patients do to disrupt uh, to, to disrupt this whole thing with, with, with the industry and prices. And the answer for Manulife was, well, Manulife's already in that space, but didn't talk about what patients could do. So Manulife's active in that space, but we're not clear what patients are doing in that space. So I'll, that's just my one comment on that. I'm going to try and frame my topic in, in, in the concept of where patients can, can, uh, can participate. Does this work? Yeah. Right. Sorry, no, right there. Right there, perfect, thank you, because I can't see it. I'm also looking at the same slides on my phone as we go. So Australia, so, so I'm starting with Australia because when I was looking around at some of the issues on funding, uh, funding uh, uh, drugs for rare diseases, uh, I noted that in Australia they're fighting some of the same challenges that we have here. And there's a large concern, in fact, they, they hold out Canada as, as, as something they aspire to emulate. I mean, think we've got problems in Canada. What's it like in Australia? Now, I should I should caution that this report is an industry-funded report. Uh, in the second page or third page of that report, you'll see all the industry company, all, all the companies that funded it. But really, when you look at it, they talk about some of the some of the major challenges that they have in terms of getting some of these orphan drugs funded, waiting you know two to four years uh, longer than than some other countries, including Canada. Uh, some of the uh, medications unavailable for eight years. Uh, no common definition of what a rare disease is with other countries. So you can hear some of the common uh, common issues that you see with uh, uh, with some of the other countries. And so some of the recommendations that came out of this report, and I this came out in November of 2014. So I'm not sure where they are today in terms of where that's going. But you can see some of the some of the important things that are again in common with some of the complaints we've ha heard here in Canada. One, they want a national strategy for rare diseases. And something common there, we've got an orphan drug framework that's in development, but the reimbursement HTA aspect of that has not been included in that. So that's something that needs to be developed. Mindful of international practice and development. So again, can we look at what's happening in other countries that may work well that we could adopt here? More flexible analysis of cost effectiveness. One of the big challenges we've seen in many markets is we have this notion of a cost effectiveness threshold. It's known as a, a, an ICE or an incremental cost effectiveness ratio. It's sometimes expressed as dollars per quality adjusted life year or dollars per quality. And it's an arbitrary threshold that was developed first in the UK and has come to Canada. It doesn't take into account things like productivity and absenteeism. And it does a very poor job of, of taking into account drugs for rare diseases where perhaps there's very few patients and much higher and, and, and therefore potentially much higher costs. So how do you address that? Unique nature of the therapies for rare diseases and they, that should be recognized in the evidence requirements for funding. Again, the, the, the challenges in, in developing and conducting clinical trials when there's very few patients, how do you do that and how do you, why should or should HTA agencies, health technology assessment agencies, hold the manufacturers of those products to the same standards as, as they would for products where there may be tens and tens of thousands of patients, uh, where it's much easier to do clinical trials. And, fi and finally, uh, that uh, you know the process for assessing new therapies for rare diseases should be efficient, fit for purpose, transparent, and informed by community and patient values. And so again, this is very similar to some of the things we've been hearing here. So again, in Australia, I'm not sure where things have gone, and, and uh, this, as I say, that report came out about a year ago. If we look at Germany, it's a bit different. I've just got the one slide on Germany. And Germany had a major change in their whole process uh, in, in just a few years ago with a, a process known as AMNOG, which is an acronym for an extremely long German word that I'd never be able to pronounce. Uh, <laughs> It, but one of the things that came out of it was this notion of assessing the additional benefit that a new technology comes to market. But one of the challenges they faced was what are we going to do with these, these, these orphan drugs, these drugs for rare diseases where when they be, get market authorization in the European Union, uh, how, how, are they going to be, uh, how are they going to be assessed? And they came up with this notion of a not quantifiable benefit where they would be, still be allowed to, uh, to go through the process and they would negotiate prices with the sickness funds or the social insurers in the uh, in, in Germany and that's how a lot of these drugs get so they they recognize the difference that they, these some of these drugs for rare uh, or orphan drugs have and then get it through the process that way 
I've been giving that time warnings here by Bill, so I'm going to have to move faster. So on to the HST in England. And this, this, this process came out because the NICE in the UK, which is the Health Technology Assessment Agency, was strongly criticized for not, and, and still is today in some respects, particularly for cancer drugs, strongly criticized for not having a process or having a process that doesn't take into account the unique characteristics of drugs for rare diseases. And so they came up with this process uh, uh, which, which followed on an, er an earlier process called highly specialized technologies. And one of the in interesting things they do, and I would encourage patient advocates in this country to do, is, is to give this whole horizon scanning. And this process starts much, much earlier. They identify drugs for this process 15 to 20 months before they would have market authorization and begin a process of health technology assessment well before market authorization occurs. The idea there is that when the product is approved for, for marketing, for commercialization, that the health technology assessment process has already happened. So you're not waiting that six, seven months to go through a cadeth like process here, plus another how many months to go through PCPA. This is all done well in advance. We just heard earlier on before lunch about Health Canada having a super fast process for ultra rare diseases. This is the kind of thing where you'd really want to have something done well in place beforehand. So I'm not going to spend much time on this on this slide, but this, this is the overview of that HST or Health uh, Highly Specialized Technologies process. And you can see that, again, there's, there's important, process, important elements in there or uh, steps along the way where patient advocates have input into the process. And, and I would, you know, I would take that, go to the NICE website and you can see that. And I think that they're also very much involved in education of patient advocates. They do a great job of that. Uh, there's there's opportunities uh, in, in the UK to do that. I've got the one minute warning here. I've got to go even faster. Uh, but one caution. We think of England and the UK as a single market. It's not. It's not. There are two more than 200 clinical commissioning groups which all have their own formularies. Sometimes they team up and they'll share formularies. Each one of those has to make a decision in terms of what they're going to fund. And NICE now has to go out and enforce to make sure that each clinical commissioning group actually pays for these new technologies, actually makes them available. So we think as the UK is a single market, it's not. And, and we have an easier time in Canada with 10 provinces, three territories, and a few federal plans, and, and, and private plans, another story. But we have an easier time than they do in the UK where they actually have to go around enforcing to make sure that these products are actually available. I'm going to finish with this slide. And it's actually got a couple of builds in it. Advance it. Oh, there. advance it there. There we go. Finish with this slide. So this this is a slide that was put together by a group called Simon Cooker out of Germany. They're a consulting firm uh, that we've adapted this slide over the years. And it's a slide that manufacturers look at in terms of how are we going to plan for health technology assessment, for pricing reimbursement globally in each market. What are the things we're going to look at? What are the factors we're going to take into account? What are the steps we have to do? And one of the things you'll see it's missing from this slide is patience. There's no patient involved. And so what I would suggest is that that patient engagement has to take place. And the question earlier patients do to, to disrupt the process, I would suggest that if, when you go through that horizon scanning exercise to see what technologies are coming, you will have a good idea in your own therapeutic area, your own disease area, what's coming. Because I know people are very active. They're scanning out there to see what's coming. Get involved early on and make sure that you have, as a patient advocates, as patient experts, a voice in the process, not just with the manufacturers, but with the early advice, scientific advice you heard about from Chandra and from Health Canada. These things go on in other countries like the UK and, and the EMA as well. Get involved. Be assertive. Be proactive. And I think that's the, the uh, probably the, the, uh, the thing that's, that's most important is getting involved in that process early on and, and then you will have an impact. Thank you. I've probably eaten into some of Glenn's time here. Actually, we're going to pass it over to Sandra oh, first. Right. And then oh, we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll Sandy's it time. Yeah. You'll have the slides later. So, uh... <laughs> we'll stand here for pictures too later. <laughs> Sandra, over to you. 
So I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Sandra Anderson. I work at NMR Strategies. And for those of you who don't know who we are, I had a chance to speak to some of you today. Um, we're Canada's largest patient support program provider. And we employ about 1,200 people in Canada. And we work with manufacturers. And we also work with payers. But today I'm focusing on the manufactured, sponsored patient assistance programs and the stuff that we do to help patients get access to these types of drugs. So there was a lot of discussion today Sorry, Bill, I'm just trying it's to it it fast. Just to talk about how, you know, how expensive some of these orphan and rare disease drugs are. Um, and we deal with them all, you know, all different types of molecules. Um, some of them cheaper, some of them more expensive. Today I wanted to focus specifically on the orphan and rare disease drugs. And just to talk about why they're different. They're different from other specialty drugs. Essentially, they are typically more expensive. Um, we do treat a lot of difficult to di diagnose diseases. Typically, the, the drugs that we work with have a very small population size. Um, a lot of them have unique patient needs, but also caregiver needs. The patients we work with are not just the patients, they're the families, they're the mothers, and they're the caregivers. Um, and so there's a lot of different unique stakeholders in the mix. Reimbursement is always a challenge. It's never easy. Um, from the moment we register a patient into one of these patient support programs, we're there to help patients understand what coverage they even have. A lot of times we speak to a patient or a caregiver, they don't even know what type of insurance they have. Wait times to see their physicians, also a big challenge. So we, a lot of times we have a nurse on the phone with the patient just to educate them and explain to them why it's taking so long, or to even coordinate and help them schedule their injection or infusions. Um, as I mentioned, there's a large amount of stakeholders involved, but there's also a lot of paperwork. The last thing a patient needs to do is think about the amount of forms that they have to fill out when they've just been diagnosed, when the family has to deal with this disease. And so our nurse case managers and reimbursement specialists on the phone do a lot of work to help them coordinate all that paperwork, to go back and forth with the clinic, and really to make it clear and easy for the patient and their family. At the end of the day, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. We're doing everything we can. Um, there is no clear pathway. I know we're on a pathway to get there. But right now, there is no clear pathway, and so we do everything on a case-by-case -case basis, and it can differ every time. One of the big things to note for a patient or a family that's going through a, um, an orphan disease or a genetic disease is that it's very different from a typical journey that a patient would go through from a common or primary care-treated um, medication. Typically, on a primary care drug or a general like heart, you know, cardiovascular disease, patient gets the goes in to get their diagnosis. They get a treatment. They go to the regular retail pharmacy, and then they go back home and they, you know, come in to see their GP every three months or so. Um, Take-home medications can also, you know, differ depending on the drug. But a lot of times it's done from a retail pharmacy and it's not necessarily done where they have to go be scheduled for infusion, for example, in a private clinic. Um, it might not involve as much paperwork. The patient journey for a person who has a rare disease is much more convoluted and complicated. I know a lot of you in this room can relate to this. I've, we put this slide together just to illustrate all the different steps, and I, I'm sure you can relate to each of them. But you can imagine the different steps it takes to get access to um, a type of drug that we're speaking about. It can involve you know, going to your physician. It could take up to 12 years, we've heard, just to even get diagnosed with a rare disease. Um, once you're diagnosed, the journey starts with the enrollment. For example, your doctor might give you a 1-800 number, and you call the 1-800 number to get registered into a program. But there's a lot of different steps throughout that journey. And it starts with reimbursement. Um, the special authorization, that's what SA submission stands for, is a very large amount of paperwork that patients who have to, if they have insurance, have to undergo this amount of paperwork. The program tries to alleviate the burden from the patient and the family, but also with the caregiver and the physician to try and navigate through that. The other big thing to note is that a lot of these manufacturers who sponsor this program recognize the fee that a patient goes through and they fund sometimes the deductibles that patients can't afford. So there is a, we call it copay assistance or financial assistance. Um, and so there's a lot of back and forth in that journey and we, the patient program tries to coordinate a lot of that. Sometimes the drugs we deal with are infusions or injections. And so we have to coordinate the pharmacy dispensing, the delivery of the drug to the patient's home, and sometimes we even have a nurse going to that patient's home to help them with their injection or help the mom giving an infusion to their child. So the amount of different steps that's required to actually get a patient on drug can be quite cumbersome, and this journey just kind of illustrates that. The onboarding itself can take days, it can take weeks, and then finally getting them to drug can take a number of um, weeks as well. Some of the key things that we've been seeing in the marketplace in general, the challenges that we face, are. Um, 
basically, as we talked about, reimbursement differs depending on what province you live in and depending on what insurance company um, you have coverage for. A lot of different administration work, not just from the family's perspective, but from the clinician's perspective. And there's a lot of changes in the private marketplace. We just heard about some of those changes, whether it's the private, the pharmacy networks, the capping, et cetera. So there are some more unique challenges that each of the uh, manufacturers have to go through, or sorry, the patients have to go through navigating. And it's our job as the patient support provider to help navigate and to understand those changes to help make that patient's journey easier. The other big thing we know with orphan and rare diseases is there's usually regional biases. So for example, you might have a rare genetic disorder where the amount of population is specific to a province. Um, we've seen this with a few of the disorders. We call it the founder's effect, for example, on the East Coast. And so the funding mechanisms in Nova Scotia are very, very different from the funding mechanisms in D.C. And so a lot of the coordination and the planning has to go in to work with the key stakeholders, to work with the patient advocate, advocacy groups in that area to make sure that the support services that we design make sense for the patients. From a patient perspective, I'm not going to go through each box, but it can, you can imagine the amount of burden that a patient and family faces when they are first diagnosed. This just illustrates the different things to think about, the high drug costs, but also the out-of-pocket costs. A lot of these plans um, don't cover all the costs, and we, we heard about that, but these out-of-pocket costs are quite cumbersome and unaffordable typically. Even the income-based um, public plans, such as Trillium in Ontario, do not cover these deductibles. And with the complex therapies for patients and access, um, it's hard for a patient to even know who to call. All the amount of patient groups that are out there, they might not know what number to call. They might get a phone call from the insurance company. They'll get a call from their patient program and from a patient advocacy group. It can get very, very confusing. Um, and then the last point is, is again, around the uh, unaffordable co-pays. This is a case study um, that I just wanted to illustrate. It illustrates a journey or kind of in a way conveys the message of the different barriers that a true patient can undergo um, when they're diagnosed. And this is looking at the PKU case study. So I got the time point, so I'll go really quickly here. But it just illustrates key areas of burden and challenge that a patient can face, not only in the condition and therapy, so understanding, and I know the slide's a bit hard to read, um, but the patient themselves has to understand that there's a amount of testing to go through, back and forth with the clinic, and then, of course, the financial burden let alone the healthcare system. So you can imagine the layers of burden that a patient has to go through. And the patient program is trying to be able to take all those burdens and coordinate and help as much as possible. One of the big things we've noticed for patients that undergo um, these diseases is the amount of high touch that's required. It's not just getting a diagnosis and getting a script. It's the amount of back and forth with the clinic. It's the amount of stakeholders that involve, the amount of tests that they have to go through, the coordination of those tests. Um, a lot of times the patient program tries to alleviate that burden for the patient, the family, and the clinician. There's also a lot of education and counseling and monitoring, um, customized clinic needs, and then specialty distribution as well. It's not a typical, a lot of these drugs, they are cold chain. Um, they do need sometimes a healthcare practitioner to train a patient or a family. And so that amount of um, care that, you know, and reconstitution, for example, can be managed by the program. This picture here just illustrates the different steps that the, the NMR caseworker or a case manager um, can help navigate the patient through. And it just kind of explains the different layers of services that each program can offer, starting from enrollment and going into um, infusion. There's one case study I'm just going to quickly talk about, and I think it relates to our discussion today. It's around reimbursement and different things that we have done that's a bit innovative in how we utilize the data that we gather through the program. Um, this is a situation where a payer wanted to understand the health outcomes um, and wanted to have proof that the patients were actually benefiting from the program. Um, we designed the program, we designed it such that we were able to capture the data, to obtain it, to obtain relevant health outcome data, and we were able to utilize the data that we garnered from the patient support program to actually work with one private insurance company to actually look at taking that data and making it meaningful, which actually led to a listing agreement. So that's not something that happens every day. It's very important from the beginning when you design a program because we have access to all this data to be able to look at the overall market dynamic and capture the endpoints. But it speaks to one of the things we're talking about today, which is what are we can do in an adaptive pathway you know, listing type model. And so one of the things we're doing more and more at NMR is because we are able to offer these patient support programs, there's a lot of data that we can use. How can we take that data and actually make it meaningful and use it when negotiating with payers? So just some quick conclusions. I think it's really important to note rare diseases present unique challenges for diagnosis, testing, reimbursement, ongoing treatment, and monitoring. 
Um, but one of the things just to keep in mind is they are product focused. Each manufacturer decides to fund these programs and design it. Um, they are patient centric. We do a lot of work with patients when we design these programs. We should probably do more and I want to talk to you today about some opportunities to work with you. But I think one of the big keynotes here is that we, when we design these programs, we're gathering real valuable life data. We talk to patients every single day helping patients. And one of the things we want to do more and more is take, these, take this data, use it, and come up with a way to literally help you know, further the rare disease orphan strategy. How can we centralize this data? How can we work with other researchers in the marketplace to provide overall meaningful data that's going to support the rare disease strategy? Thanks very much, Sandra. Um, actually, Suzanne, I was thinking about your, one of your questions that didn't get answered the last time in terms of the patchwork quilt. Um, there are a few people in the country, I keep on saying people in the country, but there are more and more where uh, people like you, Sandra, who are helping super patients, who are becoming uh, health system navigators for them, if it is a patchwork quilt across the country, how can we deal with that in order to get people on therapy at the right time? So I think that, that was a great illustration of, uh, of how to do that. So thank you. Passing it over to Glenn. You mind passing the microphone in front of you? Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, folks. Um, just to uh, beg forgiveness, this is day 14 of this role for me. Uh, uh, but I do have a, a very extensive background in this. I want to spend a, a little bit of time uh, going through the, uh, the value proposition and bef um, of, of effective medications and what it means to people's lives before I get into taking a look at some of the, uh, the um, I'm going to call it the managed cost as opposed to the managed care kinds of programs that are currently um, either quite prevalent or, or emerging right now um, because I think it's partly, part, it will partly explain some of the challenges if you take that across a country like Canada, across all the countries that, uh, that uh, manufacturers market in and understand why these things start to cost a lot of money over time as well. Uh, but it's not, it's not a justification, it's just, a, uh, just just sort of an explanation. And I also want to point out, I have not yet heard anywhere, George touched closest to it on a regulatory point of view, but I've not heard any conversation about the value of these to patients. It's always been about the payer, it's been about the regulator, it's been about the plan sponsor, but it's not really ever been about the patient. And at the end of the day, these drugs aren't being used unless people are benefiting from them. And there are different perspectives. So Quebec takes a societal perspective. Ines, for example, runs a, uh, they do a whole ethics process. And that's part of the reasons why you'll see a slightly higher uh, listing, uh, uh, both in terms of timeliness and as well as in terms of numbers of drugs than you might see in the CAV process which doesn't usually a, uh, use a, a, an ethics lens as well. Not to say that they're doing things unethically, but they don't actually put that formal lens on. So anyway, I'll move on. There we go. So have your finger will move. And by the way, um, it's very unusual that I would uh, be considered to be uh, a... Um, oh, it's the, oh, yeah, I'm, the I'm hitting the wrong button. There we go. This one over here. Oh, okay. Thanks, it's a right button and I'm left hand. It is going to go well. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, the um, so I want to show in a private marketplace. As you can see, there's th this is uh, uh, you know uh, w w what's the um, the line about uh, I've often heard describing Canada. It's difficult to live in a pluralistic society. That's just the environment on the on the private side of uh, of uh, drug coverage in this country, and uh, and this is really only dealing with those who have coverage in the private side, not the coverage on the, on, on the public side, or in fact those who don't have any uh, financial assisted coverage at all. And so it's a very complicated environment and within each of these there's many, many players that are involved and all of us are trying to navigate through that. The, um, this particular uh, piece here, uh, and again going back to uh, uh, the societal impacts if you will, and that is that uh, productivity, physical and mental uh, we, of, we often talk about um, mental health, uh, and yet, um, and it is measurable, um, and it is uh, everywhere. And uh, when um, therapies are developed for them, they're quickly uh, taken up and used. Uh, but the credit for these medicines often aren't fully understood or properly articulated when taking a look at. Who, who's costing them. And that would include public plans as well as private plans as well. So the Public Health Agency of Canada has estimated the cost of these uh, on the economy are about $200 billion every year. So every one of us as Canadians are paying some aspect of this bill directly and indirectly, whether we're an employer, whether we're an employee, whether we're a, a parent, whether we're uh, retired. Um, 
um, if you're George, you're all of those. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, uh, we forget this quite often because a lot of these things as well, as, as you start to improve, and I'll use this slide, uh, on the top 15 drivers of lost work time. Okay, and you take a look at the, the conditions that are there, if you've got really good eyes. Uh, and uh, the total cost of employees with a primary condition, and you take a look at where uh, uh, those individuals are, because this is the workforce oriented. This is the reason why um, em employer-sponsored uh, plans are very important in the space. All of this needs to tie back to the economic bottom line for each and every employer, and I think sometimes that has been lost on the connection. So now I want to take a look at some of the uh, cost containment measures. It's been touched on by, by a number of folks already, Suzanne probably mostly. So you get into sort of the basic ones, which are generic substitution. The, the, one, the one thing that people don't appreciate, uh, this is not me as Rx and D here, but don't appreciate with, uh, with uh, generics. Generics are deemed by Health Canada as bioequivalent, but they're not deemed as interchangeable. And what they mean by that is there's a range of therapeutic benefit that is similar based on the data of the original drug, but not identical necessarily. So in some cases, an individual may benefit better from a generic product than a brand product, even though it's the generic of, of, of the brand. And in other cases, it's the other way around. It's rare, except using exceptions in where you have mandatory uh, uh, generic substitution, where you can get that reversed if, they, if, if it's the wrong decision. But I just wanted to, you know, so it's really important, and you see my message on the bottom, it's really important to get to know your pharmacist on this. They'll know this better than the physician uh, because they deal with this every day. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, taking this off Great West Life because I knew Manual Life was present. Uh, uh, but but, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, one of the important things here, and I just use this as an example, prior authorization, uh, they have a list of about 100 plus drugs, et cetera. This is not an uncommon thing at all in government or publicly sponsored plans. Um, and I did a quick look at these drugs and I can't find one on a publicly sponsored plan that wouldn't be a prior authorization or a special authorization. So, uh, but what they do, do, and in the private space it gets to be a challenge because in, in prior authorization, you're asking the clinician who, to justify to a payer what they're going to do to the patient um, and why they need that drug versus another drug. And the private payer particularly doesn't have all the information at their access or disposal, which is not necessarily true in the public payer sense because of electronic health records, privacy legislation, et cetera. So this can be a very um, uh, challenging environment for patients to navigate, and I know it's difficult for plan sponsors and insurers to navigate as well, but it does slow down um, access and often impede treatment. Tiered formularies. So in the case of tiered formularies, um, the, the common trend in a tiered formulary is they cluster drugs by type of drug, similar products of similar effectiveness, and they typically adjust the uh, copay back to the patient based on which tier the drug falls in. What is interesting about this is, is that it's largely about who's sharing the cost to get access to what drug, and it's not necessarily built on the clinical requirements that are being made as a decision by the clinician with the patient. So it's an administrative adjustment for cost with some clinical evidence to categorize them in the category, but not necessarily factoring the unique circumstances of the patient. It, this is really a top-down model. Again, um, this is not typically done in, in public plans, though, in Canada, but this is something that is starting to show up in the private plans in Canada. And again, um, I finally stalled one out. I was hoping to make it through. Uh, with a message. I hung up with a message, so Bill's getting his messages, I see. I'm getting lots of them. Yes. So, and again, uh, and, and again, I'm purposely picking on poor, poor Great West Life here, but it's not really intended to pick on Great West Life. On my next slide, which is, uh, and this is something that is um, uh, um, therapeutic class pricing. And you, you hear this various terms for this. You'll hear. Uh, 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 reference drug pricing, reference base pricing, uh, therapeutic class pricing. And what they're basically saying is they're setting for a, a category of drugs 
what is the price that uh, the plan is prepared to pay or, or accept um, at a certain level? And if you want to uh, have another drug in that in that space, then um, you pay something that's different and typically higher than that. What What's interesting about this is that it's putting it on the consumer as a consumer choice, but it's actually the clinician who's choosing the product. And it's not a clinical choice, it's a consumer choice. And I think there's a piece of information, awareness and uh, in that transaction that is a disconnect here. And so it puts the patient in a difficult position, potentially financially, but certainly clinically, to go against their physician. And often the pharmacist is the individual who is having to deal with this particular conversation. Uh, uh, health case management program. I think anyone in, in the pharmaceutical industry is big on health case management. I think it, it's the way to demonstrate the value that you need to go through uh, on this. And uh, so what you're saying is I'm five minutes away from Neil's time. That's what I'm appreciating. <laughs> and the, um, uh, but, but I will say the, uh, uh, this is also difficult to do in the private space because the type of information collected, the purpose for which it collected, various jurisdictions have privacy legislation related to health information. So the ability or even the legal right to collect some of this information can somewhat impede uh, this from being optimal for patients in the in the private plan. So a lot of empathy in this space, uh, and 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 therefore it can be very clunky in, her, in terms of its effectiveness and how it might work. So again, uh, I want to close with um, uh, uh, the the, the, third, the the thirteen actuals, but I, I want to also address the hepatitis C. Uh, uh, drugs that came up a little earlier, um, but basically we've been trending at about 2.3, uh, 2.4% over the last few years. It's it's true. We've had a spike in the last two years, and it's true that a therapeutic group of the new the new hepatitis C drugs have um, have come into the marketplace and have certainly hit the system hard. I will say though, and it's important to appreciate. We talked. Uh, I think uh, Stephen earlier said you know we had a 1.2 million dollar drug. And, and things of that nature. These drugs are nowhere near that on a per patient basis, but we have a lot of patients with hepatitis C. Um, but what is but what is uh, different with this drug? It's one of the few drugs that have come into the system, or the or a group of drugs that come into the system, who are substantially curative. So when you actually take it on on the total cost burden over the over the uh, over the uh, the, the history of a, of a patient with hepatitis C to actually cure the patient of the disease. This is not no longer chronic. Cure them. This is actually on a per patient basis very, very inexpensive. And I think that gets lost when you're looking at, at how uh, they're paid for. And I think it's some of the challenge from the private sector as well as the public sector around drugs like this is they're absorbing an inflow on a short time duration of a big spike in, in cost for, for a patients that haven't had access to an effective therapy for a long time, let alone a curative therapy. But three, four years from now, those hepatitis C drugs are, because most people will have been cured if they've had access to them, that drops off. And it's not to say other things don't come, but it's a very important question to pose to all of us in this room is, as we start to hit more cure drugs, are we now going to start paying for less? And I think that's where I'm just going to leave it at this point in time. Thanks very much, Glenn. Join me in uh, thanking the panel. So we officially got about seven minutes left on the webinar. I'd like to thank everyone uh, online for, for participating. There were a couple of questions from, from uh, um, previously that we, we didn't get to. Uh, one was regarding the, um, the nature of the, the private insurance industry also being a uh, for-profit uh, um, industry and sector. I think we're going to have to take that one offline, uh, but certainly uh, um, we can take that up uh, again. There was another question from John Peter. I believe I don't, I don't know what person named John Peter. John Peter Bradford, thank you for uh, signing into the webinar today, asking about um, the regulatory review process and the, the types of clinical trials that the industry has to come up with. Is there any way to speed up that process? And what can you know patients and others do in order to make that more not just speedy but more efficient and therefore less costly? And then perhaps 
um, you, know, you come up with some, some products that are a little bit less uh, pricey. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. No, it does make sense. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, uh, clinical trials, uh, uh, and, and let's set aside the, uh, the ultra-rare diseases for the moment because they have their own clinical trial challenges, and we can talk about that a little later if you want. But with, re with respect to sort of um, larger population-based conditions and illnesses, um, uh, Canada is actually a very great location to do it because we have a highly heterogeneous population, which means that we have people from everywhere in this country. And so if you're trying to represent what a marketplace might look like uh, internationally, Canada is one of those countries that you can cover a lot of people in a trial. But you also need to have a very powerful trial. What we mean by that is a large number of people. Uh, in the trial so that you're going to capture kind of funny things on each end of the uh, clinical dynamics for it. So um, that part surprisingly doesn't add the cost that you think it does with regards to time lapse because that's all done prior to bringing the uh, the product into the regulatory cycle. I mean, you, you, you've, you've got your, make sure that your clinical trials are, um, uh, the methodology is approved and acceptable, meets all the standards, et cetera. And that can vary a little bit from country to country, but it's more uniform than most other areas of the system are. <clears throat> when you hit the regulatory environment, and, and, and for example, in Health Canada's case, uh, and this is not untrue in the EMA in Europe or in the FDA or other countries, is they're actually only looking at random clinical trials, so for the drug, and they're really looking for two things. One, they're looking to see if it does what the, uh, the, uh, the study indicates it's supposed to do, in other words, efficacy, and it's also looking at safety. So what uh, harm did it create to patients or, 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 and, and or what type of harm? And then they'll do a balancing act on uh, its efficacy to safety to determine whether or not it is worthy of being um, uh, marketed in Canada. And that will then create a whole bunch of time around what we call the, mono the monograph in terms of laying all the technical pieces out for clinicians to understand how it should be used, what they should watch out for, et cetera, any kind of flags that they need to worry about. That is very expensive, takes a long time and it's done every single country. And that adds extraordinary amount to cost. So that uh, we do it with the FDA, we do it with the European Union, we do it with Japan, we do it with Australia, Singapore, it goes on. And that adds an extraordinary amount of cost to it. And what's also interesting is looking at the same information, they arrive at different recommendations and conclusions or cautions that they want to mark which also then adds a lot more complexity to it. So if there was some way to sort of streamline or harmonize or even have reciprocity in some cases, uh, then uh, you might be able to save a significant amount of cost to the development of the drug. And, and remember, um, the majority of new drugs who come to market do not actually cover the cost of development over their active life cycle because the piece that's missing is from the moment you are moving into that system, your patent clock is now running. And for that 20-year period, which everyone believes to be 20 years, typically in Canada, it's between 8 and 12 years that they actually have market exclusivity. So you've already burned up 8 to 10 years before you even get into the market. Thanks very much. Um, Neil, and I know Durhan would, would really want me to ask this question if, if no one else is going to ask it. Uh, in terms of managed entry agreements, uh, or managed access pathways. Is, are there any things that we can learn from, from what's happening overseas uh, to be able to inform some more innovative uh, agreements? And, and Sandra, thank you for, for showing a case study on, on a way that you could support that. But anything you've seen from, from the UK or, or elsewhere that you think Canada could, could learn from? Yeah, certainly there's, there's lots of examples in, in uh, UK, Italy, Australia, and other markets where uh, they they sometimes called patient access schemes and uh, mm -hmm. where where they they're finding ways to bring these products into market. They're managing them uh, on an active basis to make sure that the, the the not only are the patients getting the products, but that they're done in a cost-effective way. And also looking at the sustainability. Now, one of the challenges in all of that is that they're often started with uh, um, incomplete evidence. Uh, but the idea is to develop that evidence as, it, as, as you go along to make sure that, in fact, the product is effective. But it shares the risk between the manufacturer and, and, the, and the government payer. But the objective is to try and get the, the, uh, 
the uh, the new technology to the patient as quickly as possible without delays. And there's you know each each market that one of the challenges is that these systems are put in place and they're put on top of an existing healthcare structure. In each market, each country has its own healthcare structure, and so you can't just mm -hmm. take a model in one country and dump it into this mm -hmm. country. But you can take elements of it and and learn from it and develop it that way. And and I think there's some some great ideas. And I would come back to the, the objective needs to be to get these products to the patient and paid for as soon as they are approved, and in some cases before they're actually approved, so they're managed in. And, mm -hmm. and George talked about the hot potato, mm -hmm. and we're seeing more. You know, it was it was government, and uh, and and you know, I think you know Sandra did a great explanation of how her firm and other firms like that help get reimbursement for products. And, and often manufacturers will say, well, look, you know, we're going to get some private payer coverage. We'll bring the market, the product market right away. It's getting some coverage that way. And, and, and we'll provide the product, in some cases, free to everybody else who doesn't have private payer coverage. And now the hot potato has moved into the private pay. And you can understand that. They're, you know, I think Stephen and, and Suzanne talked a lot about the, the increased cost to the private insurer industry. The unintended or you know, not necessarily unintended consequences, now the hot potato is being passed back to the manufacturer. And the manufacturer is going to have to decide, are we going to cover the cost of the drug for 18 months while it works its way through the CADF and PCPA and everything else process? Or are we just going to wait, as they do in other countries, wait until that process is complete and then uh, commercialize the product? The, the loser in all of this is patients. Mm -hmm. And so patients need to be on top of this mm -hmm. early on. I can understand where Manulife's coming from and Great West and all these other companies because right now they're holding the hot potato. Mm -hmm. And and so now they're trying to get out of it and they're going to pass it off to the manufacturer. But I think we, what we need to do is find a system where the product comes to market the, the, the moment or even before the moment it's approved, there is funding in place. And that's going to mean everybody getting involved and that's going to take patients really stepping up to the plate and finding a way to push everybody uh, to, to, to get there and not just having each group looking after their own interests. And then, and then how can private payers actually um, manage that hot potato too? Are you talking about them providing access right away as well or what, what can they do? Because we, the last panel talked about some of those challenges. Um, often when we're talking about innovative product listing agreements or managed access, we're talking about governments. What's the role of private payers? Well, I think we heard Lindy's talking about negotiating some of these agreements even before NOC. Did I hear that right? I think I heard that right. And so there's an opportunity for manufacturers to get into that process and start talking about some of those agreements. Now, if they're going to wait for CATA to come back with their review, well, that's going to be delay. Mm -hmm. But I, I expect mm -hmm. that there may be opportunities in a more creative way to say, well, let's fund this on a provisional basis while we wait for CATA to do what CATA does. Uh, take and, and, and fund this and, and come up with whether it's with Manulife or, or Great West or Sun Life or whoever it is, uh, come up with some agreement to, that, that can uh, make sure that patients get these products as soon as they're approved by healthcare. Okay, so I'd like to thank everybody online from Melbourne, Australia to Prince Edward Island uh, to all across the country really and uh, for, for participating and that's the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network that is helped uh, host these webinars, uh, and certainly great thanks to the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders for wel welcoming this opportunity to broadcast from this amazing room here of uh, patient experts in health technology assessment. Uh, I think that's an understatement. Uh, you know, the, the, the quality of the patient engagement that I've seen in the last you know, 12 years that I've been on it has been uh, phenomenal. And so a real hats mm -hmm. off to everyone in this room uh, for, for taking the time to come here to sit for an hour and 45 minutes uh, and interact with us. I, I hope we can keep this dialogue going and thank you all the panelists for sticking around uh, because I know that there are a lot more questions to be asked and uh, we're, we're getting there. So thank you very much. Okay, everybody. Uh, Matt here from CCSN, and we're just uh, finishing up now. You can see they're all uh, done getting up out of their seats, and uh, we just want to thank um, Bill and and all the panelists today uh, for all the, the you know the hard work that they did and and all the information they gave us. I think it was really good. We also want to thank uh, the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders uh, for helping us uh, you know 
giving us the opportunity to do this today. I think it was really, really good. Um, and then, of course, all of our sponsors for our 2015 webinar series, Novartis, Merck, uh, especially Boehringer, Engelheim, as well as Janssen for making today's webinar possible. And we'd also like to thank all of you who've stuck around for, I know this is a much longer webinar than we normally have. So thanks to all of you for sticking around and, uh, and, uh, and watching along with us from places all around the world and all around Canada. Uh, we hope to see you all next week at our next webinar on uh, the Cancer Medication Geographical Roulette in Canada, and we will uh, see you all next time.